Hi, and welcome to the Freelancers Union Freelance Tax Webinar. My name is Laura Murphy, and I'm here with Ace Cowood of Painless 1099. Hey, Ace. Hey, guys. And <laughs> Jonathan Meadows, um, our freelance tax expert. Um, hi, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. How are you? So, over a thousand people responded to this invite, and I know you guys are on a deadline. That's April 18th. So I will get right to the screen share here and go into the slides. Ready? Ooh. All right. Mastering self-employment taxes. Um, as you all know, taxes aren't exactly easy for freelancers, uh, but we're, we're here, we've got you covered with everything you need to know. And I'm gonna let our tax expert, Jonathan Meadows, take it away. Hi everyone, hope everyone's doing well today. 29th, reminder, the 18th is when your tax return is due. If you can't file on time, you can file for an extension. If you think you owe money, you should pay with your extension whatever you think you owe. That's just my plug. So Laura, Laura and Ace asked me to chat briefly about a few things today. One thing they asked me to speak about are legal entities. And I get this question all the time in my practice. Hey, I'm a freelancer. Should I be an entity? And I always give my stock answer. It depends. So there are different type of entities. There are some pros. There are some cons. In addition to generic pros and cons, there are very specific pros and cons, which I'll touch upon based upon your jurisdiction. So let's begin 101. If you're a freelancer and you don't do anything, you're known as a sole proprietor or, or you have a sole proprietorship. Bottom lines, that's the most basic of being a freelancer on Schedule C, which is where you report your self-employed earnings and expenses, you report your freelance revenue, and you list your business expenses. Pro is it's very simple. It's the default. Con is you're not allowed to be on pay yourself on a W-2, and although I'm not an attorney, it, it, it may set yourself up to some legal issues in case someone wants to sue you. Entity choice is an LLC. There are two types of LLCs. There's a Single member LLC and a multi member LLC. I'm going to talk about single member LLCs. An LLC is a legal entity. Taxes are filed the same as if you're a sole proprietor or a regular freelancer. The only addition is is that under with an LLC, you get some you, you may avail yourself of some legal protections in case someone wants to sue you. There's another type of entity that, mo that a lot of freelancers use it's called an S corporation. Essentially, you're supposed to be on salary. You're supposed to pay yourself a payroll. The goal of an S corporation is to legally pay you, pay yourself payroll as low as legally possible. You have to pay yourself a reasonable salary. And the difference you should take as a profit distribution. Both the wages and the profit distribution are subject to income tax. The difference is, is that the profit distribution is not subject to social security taxes. However, in some jurisdictions like New York City, it may be subject to a New York City business tax that may not be as tax efficient as it would be if you were outside of New York City. Also requires a separate tax return. I would say if you're considering filing, forming an LLC or an S corporation, you may want to consult with a an accountant and or lawyer just to see the, the advantages both in terms of legal protection in terms of tax protection that you may you, you may you may achieve with those things uh, Laura next slide perfect get a lot of my questions expenses and deductions hey Jonathan what can I take there are a bunch of sample expenses here what I always tell my clients is hey what do you spend money on over the course of the year you should, and if you haven't, maybe as a uh, something for 2017, you should be keeping track of your business expenses. Meaning, I, I know for myself as a professional, I have a lot of computer expenses. I hire other professionals, attorneys, other freelancers. I have people on payroll that I keep track of. I have mundane things such as office supplies, rent, business meals and ent entertainment, professional development, multiple levels of insurance. This is the US after all where you need this. 
for a lot of our freelancers, they may also be working out of their home and they may be able to take a, a home office dedu deduction. Each circumstance is different. I would say that you know you should take avail yourself of Schedule C, which is I call it the Bible of being a freelancer. Take a look at all the expenses listed there and see if you qualify for any of them. Going forward over the course of the year, you should maintain original receipts in case of audit. And yes, the IRS still audits, even though their audit their audit uh, profiles are down of late. They would ask for original receipts. So it's really important that you do your paperwork over the course of the year. Keep track of your expenses keep receipts of your expenses and do your due diligence over the course of year to determine what you can deduct. Um, next slide, Laura. Now, I briefly touched upon what you should be doing. You should be keeping track of your business income and expenses. Expenses I talked about before. Income meaning, for most freelancers, they pay taxes when the money is paid to them. So if you have a client that didn't pay you at year end, you don't pay taxes on that until the year that you get paid. There's also you know, a myriad of other obligations. You need to pay estimated taxes, and I'm sitting in New York City, so that entails the following. Federal estimated taxes encompassing both your self-employment tax and your income tax. New York State personal income tax. New York City personal income tax. And for some of our other clients, New York City unincorporated business tax. I think it's really important that you become acquainted with all the different tax obligations that you may have given where you live. And for some of our freelancers, they may have obligations in multiple states if they do work in more than one place. You know, if you work in New Jersey and you live in New York, you may have tax obligations in both locations. In addition to this, I would say also become aware if you have any sales tax obligations. A lot of time, freelancers aren't aware that sales taxes are not only for goods but they're also for certain services that are performed and you know you should be aware of the forms that you should um, that you need to follow over the course of the year a 1040 ES is an estimated tax form that you pay your estimated taxes with a W9 is an information document that you give to people that want to hire you so that they can generate 1099s a 1099 is what someone who pays you reports to the government how much money was paid to you and on Schedule C is your revenue and expenses from your freelance activities. Laura, do you have any questions? No, I, I think we're good. Perfect. So, change to the 2017 tax code. I don't want to touch upon politics, but I think we'd all agree that we're in a period in transition in this country, and no one really knows what's going to happen in the next few months because the people in charge don't know themselves. So... You know, there's a new tax deadline this year. It's, you know, April 18th. It was extended a couple of days because of weekend and other holidays. If you file, if you have foreign bank accounts, there's also, that deadline has been moved up to April, to April 18th. There are, there are different, um, there are slight changes to standard deductions. And, and there's always some individual tax credits and business tax deductions that get tweaked every year. And the Social Security thresholds, when you have to pay into Social Security, rose about $7,000 between 2016 and 2017. And in addition to this, certain states such as New York and Alabama are now requiring you to enter in your driver's license and a certain PIN code on the back to, to uh, prevent identity theft. That's it in a nutshell. It'll be interesting to see what's going to happen over the next few months as changes have been proposed. I've heard multiple instances of corporate reform. I've heard proposals to change in the corporate tax rate, but unfortunately that itself won't help freelancers because those are specifically for C-corporation and not for flow-through entities. So hopefully there'll be some changes um, you know, in 17 regarding uh, taxes to the self-employed. Personally, I would love them to see some sort of threshold for self-employment taxes that doesn't kick in on the first, let's say, $50,000 or so. But we'll see what happens. That's, 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 that's to be debated, and we'll see what, what happens with that. Great. Our next Thanks. slide. Um, yes, so we do have our Freelancers Union Tax Resource Center. There are a number of free downloadable tax resources and guides, many of them co-authored by Jonathan Meadows. Um, so please check it out. Uh, hopefully you've taken some notes from this presentation, but you know these guides are, are really helpful, especially if it's your first time um, doing taxes. Uh, we will have time for questions at the end of this presentation. So um, 
hold your horses. And now we're going to move into the second half of the presentation, which is about saving, saving to pay taxes. Um, you know, as we all know, with episodic income, saving up for quarterly estimated taxes or even the big, you know, year-end payout can really be difficult for freelancers. But it is not actually impossible. So I'm going to turn it over to our friends at Painless 1099, and they can talk about some of their strategies for um, strategies and tools for making saving possible as a freelancer. Uh, Ace, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, so you guys saw that slide on saving. I think there's an interesting piece when it comes to being self-employed. Uh, that we don't talk about a lot. And this is, is really not even a self-employment issue. It's an issue that we've seen across the country, across Western culture as a whole. And it's that we're really, really bad at setting money aside and not touching it. Uh, I'm sure Jonathan can attest to uh, seeing some of his clients come through and say, hey, I didn't set anything aside for taxes and you know, now I owe money and how am I supposed to come out of pocket to, to handle that? Um, what we see by the numbers and uh, societal piece is something like 68, almost 70% of Americans can't cover a minor emergency. That's 400 to 1,000 bucks without selling an asset or putting themselves in a hole. Uh, so when we talk about financial responsibility and, and being able to set money aside and not touch it, this is a universal issue. And I think that if you take nothing else away from our segment, it's if you don't save well, you're not alone. Uh, and if you do save well, you're probably in the minority. Um, and so I am in the first camp rather than second, which is a big piece of why we built Painless 1099. Um, you know, we're really good at doing the things we do as freelancers. Uh, my background, strategy, brand, copy for corporate clients, all the way down to startups and kind of sole proprietors. And like when I was doing work, I was really good at strategy and brand. The financial piece and handling back office is something that I didn't really want to think about. Um, and I wish had been automated. And you know, the beauty of being an entrepreneur is you get to build products uh, for people like you that solves a real problem. Painless 1099 is certainly one of them. So uh, the short on our product is we built a smart bank account that handles some of the automated pieces of your financial world, uh, specifically tax withholding. Um, so with Painless, we do a couple things for you. Uh, we set you up with a new FDIC insured bank account. That bank account's in your name and it has an account and routing number uh, that you can use for all of your payments. Uh, so you set up, sign up for a bank account, uh, and then you go back to work. And so the second piece is depositing into this account. As you're earning income throughout the year, uh, you're dropping funds into this painless account. So whether that's out of your PayPal or Venmo account, if that's how you get paid, that could be from Chase Quick Pay, Harvest, Fresh Books or direct deposit if you drive for Uber on the side or something like that. Uh, and then after that, every time a deposit comes in, we calculate taxes for you. Uh, so whatever your self-employment obligation is, we take federal, state, and uh, in some pockets, local into consideration and make sure you're saving enough on the front end to pay your quarterlies and then throughout the year avoid getting hit with a bill that you can't cover. Um, so once you're set up, once you're linked, We'll take care of your savings, but we'll also bundle up some reports on your earnings uh, for folks like Jonathan. You know, we're not trying to eat his lunch by any means. We're trying to make his life and your life a little bit easier. Um, so I'll walk you through kind of how the platform looks, how it works, and, uh, and then Jonathan and I can jump into some questions coming from you folks uh, at home online right now. Um, Laura, if we could hop to the next slide. As you get to Painless, you'll see a, a really easy site like this. We walk you through some of the security pieces uh, as well as just how the platform works. And if you click sign up at the top, we'll walk you through getting your account opened and then drop you into a dashboard that's pretty uh, intuitive to use. Uh, so on the next slide, you'll really see where our calculation comes into effect. Uh, so we get your status, you know, if you're filing single, uh, head of household, married, married, filing jointly, et cetera. We'll get your dependents, which state you're filing taxes, and if you earn in more than one state. And then we'll give you a really quick base calculation on how much should be coming out of every check before expenses. Um, so this is a big piece of kind of the, the magic that happens automatically for you guys. Uh, and then on the next slide, you really see the data we give you when you log in. You know, we designed Painless as a set it and forget it platform. You really don't need to log in every day 
You shouldn't be checking your account balance every day. The best part of saving from a psychological perspective is getting money out of sight, out of mind, and then going back to work and focusing on uh, the work that you do well. And so we'll give you account and routing number to set up painless for direct deposit or getting funds into that account. Um, we'll tell you where that money is, how much money you have, and then uh, how you're saving. So whether that's projected, where we watch your tax status and income over the course of the year, or whether you know how much you should save from every check and want to put in that fixed rate, we give you that option depending on your lifestyle and whether you work with an accountant or not. Um, and then on the next slide, you know, for the folks who don't get uh, direct deposit, if you're getting physical checks, there's a really easy way to pull money into that painless account. Uh, and you can either make a withdrawal, so take funds out. We know how episodic income works. We're not uh, naive to the fact that sometimes you need that cash. Uh, we'll kick you a little alert and say, hey, pay attention to the, uh, the funds that you should be saving if you're pinching into this. But the other option is to make a deposit uh, into your painless account from whatever account that you've linked uh, where you might have deposited a check from a client. And so on the next, uh, next page, Laura, you'll see the option for depositing into your painless account. Um, so you can pull, say you get a $500 check, you can pull 500 of your money into painless. Or the other option is to say, hey, I earned $500. Uh, you need to tell me how much I should be saving from that. And that's the second option that you'll see down at the bottom of the screen. So depositing the gross or applying your withholding settings uh, to get your savings, whereas you get to keep the net uh, in, your, in your other account. Um, and then on the next slide, there are a couple perks to depositing in the painless, I think. One of the things that we've seen as freelancers and, and freelancers that built this product uh, is that finding a transaction listing or a pay stub, if you will, is tough. In the W-2 world, you get a pay stub. Somebody tells you how much you earned, when you earned, and how it was separated. When you're a 1099, nobody's doing that for you. And so the beauty of what we've built at Painless is you get a transaction listing that not only breaks down uh, when you earned, where that deposit came in from, but it also tells you what we separated for your federal, state, uh, Medicare, and Social, Se Social Security. So we give you a pretty comprehensive list of all of your transactions that you can bundle up at year end and say, this is what I earned. It matches with my 1099 or doesn't, um, and then get that rectified before you file your taxes at year end. Um, so that's a pretty easy overview of Painless. Um, it's, it's a set it and forget it platform, like we said. And the beauty here is it's built by folks like you guys. Um, for folks like you guys. And so we're, we're excited to share what we're doing. We're excited to work with, with guys like the Freelancers Union and Jonathan. Um, and really, you know, we're making the experience of setting money aside and staying out of uh, tax trouble painless. Um, and, and hopefully that's something that, that makes sense for you guys and we're excited to have you on board. Um, so I think we can jump into some questions now. Uh, I'd imagine there are a couple Thanks. rolling in. Thanks so much, Thanks Ace. Thanks so much, Ace. Um, um, All right. Uh, thanks so much, Ace. We uh, we are looking now for member questions. Um, all right. How about this one for Jonathan? Um, how does it work if you gig internationally and domestically? Good question. Is a person living internationally or working inside the U.S.? Ah. Exit stage left. Are you living internationally or working inside the in the U.S.? We don't know. <laughs> okay. Let me just assume this person's working with some someone, let's say from Germany, and they're physically present in the U.S. <clears throat> Similar to how you're paid with other clients, you need to report your income on sources earned inside and outside the U.S. And even if you're paid in Deutschmark, I'm oh, sorry, euros, I'm dating myself, or uh, British pounds, it's still subject to U.S. income taxes. If you're paying taxes in the other country, you can avail yourself of a foreign tax credit. If you're working outside the U.S., that's a whole other ball of wax. In that case, depending upon how long you're living inside the U.S., you may be entitled to a foreign income exclusion. So it just depends. Bottom line, all the, all the income is taxable. 
inside the U.S., you have to report it. But if you're living out, earning the income while living outside the U.S., some of it may be exempt from U.S. taxes. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we have another question for you um, about quarterly taxes. Mm -hmm. Do you file your business expenses for quarterly taxes or just for yearly taxes? So you pay taxes based upon your estimated profit. So you may want to factor that in. Got it. Bottom line, when you pay the estimated taxes, they're not asking to see that information. The government's merely asking for money. Great. Um, a question from Lori. How do I account for my payments under 4600 and therefore do not receive a 1099 for? Um, well, first of all, 1099 should be issued to you by anyone paying you more than $600 or more. So regardless of whether you receive a 1099 or not, you should be reporting that, in, that income to the U.S. government and to your state and local tax authorities. But don't forget to take advantage of, the, of your expenses that you're legally allowed to deduct. Yeah, and I think Laurie updated that question to uh, to six hundred uh, rather than forty six. That's okay. I, I kind of got it. I kind of I thought it was something else. That's why I said. Bottom line, you need to report it though. Sure. Great. But don't forget to take into account your expenses. You're entitled to take that. Um, how about photos of original receipts? Um, does that count as an original receipt? This is a question from Shannon. No, that's a good question. Yeah, scans would work in case of audit. Great. Cool. So yes to photos. But make sure um, it's saved in a place that you can find in a couple of years in case someone asks you a question. That makes sense. So keep keep the photos for a couple of years. Uh, three years at least. Three years at least. Is that the is that the rule of thumb for all tax documents, Jonathan? Would you say? I actually recommend six to be technically three, but I recommend six. Um. Great. So we have a question on painless ACE. Does that work with a platform like QuickBooks? Sure. So um, the short answer is do we directly integrate with QuickBooks? No. Uh, nor Wave or Bench. Um, you'll see a couple integrations coming online um, here pretty shortly. We're excited about those. Um, but the beauty, I, I think, for us, the reason we started in the place that we started was handling the savings, and then you'll be able to import some data uh, from those apps. And so uh, keep an eye out for updates there. If you uh, at least start signing up for an account, you'll get email invites um, either via our newsletter or, uh, or your account portal. Great. Um, and I'd also like to mention that freelancers union members do get a 15% discount um, when they sign up for Painless 1099. So please check it out. Um, it's a it's a great you know not being able to pay taxes in full um, at the end of the year is is the interest rates are high the penalties are high it's really like a, I've been there so it's really a tough tough spot to be so um, a platform like Painless is is just a great solution for people who who aren't that great at saving. Um, all right, how about this one from Jhob Test? How do you handle estimated quarterly taxes if your quarter is a loss? You only need to pay estimated taxes if you have a profit. Oh, there we go. Um, OK, this is a deductions question. Uh, so as, as you know, Jonathan, um, a lot of freelancers these days are, you know, also working at WeWorks, but they may also have an at-home office. So if if a freelancer normally works for home from home but pays rent on on a desk or or a WeWork type office for half the year and also work from home, can they take the home office as a deduction, or does it have to be one or the other? It's usually one or the other. There are some exceptions, but it's. If, in case of audit, it would probably be, come down to one or the other. Cool. Great. Um, hey, Laura, I saw a, a couple questions on, on billing on our side. And uh, 
happy to Great. clear that up really quickly. Yeah. So um, awesome that you know, we're working with Free Lunches Union. They take care, they take care of you guys for sure. Um, so for Free Lunches Union members, we actually charge a, a quarter percent uh, of each deposit. So um, you know, half of half of a percent for money that comes in, and really uh, that's the that's the cost for automating that transaction. So what's interesting, and this is maybe counter to what you'd expect from a, uh, a startup guy, if you're one of those folks who has meticulous records and you move money from account to account, this may not be the product for you. I certainly don't need to charge you for a service you don't need. Um, and so like, if you're doing that already, if you manually handle it, that's great. You really built this product to automate that process where you'd be j jumping into accounts, moving money from point A to point B, uh, and that quarter of a percent with the uh, with the discount is is really how we charge for painless. And so, um, pretty nominal fee. We don't charge you more than 125 bucks on the year. And for the average freelancer, what we've seen is that comes out to about eight dollars a year. Uh, but we don't want to charge you, or eight dollars a month. I'm sorry. Uh, we don't want to charge you monthly on a fixed basis because we know your income varies and so we're charging a percent rather than a flat fee but it's about eight to ten bucks a month it's pretty uh, pretty straightforward great thanks Ace. Um, so if a freelancer isn't using a platform like 1099 which kind of automates savings for them um, what what percentage of um, every paycheck would you recommend that a freelancer put aside, Jonathan? Um, you know, it depends. 30% to 33% depends upon the jurisdiction you live in. Um, yeah, those are good rules as a number. Those, those, that's a good rule. That's a good rule. For, for deductions like office space, um, you know, other business properties, should should freelancers be taking photos of those to have them backed up in case of an audit? So you're, I think what you're trying to ask me is in case of an audit, like documenting the home office? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, good, that's a good question. Yeah, I've had it on occasion where it comes up as an issue with the IRS or state tax authority. So I'd always recommend taking schematics to show that your home office area is being used exclusively for work. It doesn't have to be a closed room, but it but it has to be an area that's exclusively used for business. So if you lived in a loft, it can be a corner of the loft, but it has to be a business environment. You can't have a bed there. You can't sleep on there. You know, you can't have a dining room table. It has to be, it can be an office. It could be filing cabinets. That's, a, a, that's fine. It can be a drafting table, but it has to be something that's exclusive. Yeah, taking pictures, maybe drawing a schematic of the floor plan, showing where it is, I think that'd be good as well. What would you say, um, you know, recently, uh, I saw an article that said the best way for freelancers to prepare for an audit is to assume that they will be audited. Um, so what would you say are the red flags that the IRS looks at when they're, when they're looking at freelance tax returns? Number one, low profitability. That's usually a red flag. I'm not saying it's oh. not appropriate, but if you have a million dollars in revenue and you have t you're losing ten dollars or $20,000, I'm going to give you a high probability of being audited. Expenses, oh, that are at, expenses that are out of whack in proportion to national standards. Typically also high soft expenses, a lot of travel in proportion to your revenue. Meals, auto. Very, very soft expenses that are high also may, may trip you up. Nice. Interesting. Yeah, and I, uh, I think going on the assumption you're going to be audited is not a bad assumption in terms of keeping you honest and in terms of documenting yourself appropriately. Now, mind you, there's a cost balance of documenting yourself. So, you know, there's, there's a bit of a trade-off on that. Got it. Uh, so if, if a freelancer were to change business entities mid-year, um, how would that affect their taxes? So, what, what, so do you mean like they're, they go from, S -corp, from being a sole proprietor to an S corporation, something like that? Yeah, yeah, something okay. like that. Yeah, okay. So pretty much in that case, you would file two sep separate tax. Which you'd file Schedule C for the first half of the year. Then going forward, you would have your revenue and your business expenses on your S corporation tax return. So you just would have to have a clear cutoff and like two sets of records in that case. It's almost like if you if just if you switch jobs during the year, same sort of thing. 
yeah. You need, you need to, it's like starting a baseball game again. You need a yeah. separate, separate, separate scorecard. Okay, that makes sense. Um, let's see. So what about um, cash income? Well, it's reportable. How, how do people report? Yep. It's reportable. I don't understand the distinction between cash and check or credit card. All income is reportable by, by U.S. standards. Can you write, write off the painless 1099 subscription? That you can. Absolutely you can. That's a legitimate. That's an ordinary necessary business expense, yes. Yep. And you can also write off CPA fees or legal fees as well. Um, for ACE, for painless 1099, um, how – Cynthia would like to know, how can – how can I be sure that you're protecting my banking info? And um, why do you need need uh, subscribers to enter your bank account um, info on your site? Yeah, that is a phenomenal question. So uh, the the short on trusting our trusting our platform, uh, we work with an FDIC insured bank. Lincoln Savings Bank has been a phenomenal partner. Uh, so your funds are sitting in a Lincoln account uh, that we really facilitate and have attached our algorithm to. Um, on the security side, you know we run at bank grade security, so two two hundred fifty six bit encryption. Um, and for the sensitive information that we get from you, granted, uh, keep in mind that you're opening up a bank account, so it is just like going into a Wells Fargo off the street and giving them that same information. Um, you know. Getting that information allows us to make sure two things. One, uh, we call it KYC, know your customer. We need to verify that you are who you say you are. So you'll answer a couple security questions as you go through the sign-up process. Uh, and then on the second portion, we call it AML or anti-money laundering. Um, we run you through a couple databases, the, the biggest one being Patriot Officer, uh, to make sure you, and I use the royal you, Cynthia, I'm sure that's not applicable, but we need to make sure you're not a terrorist. Um, and so we need to make sure real money from real freelancers is coming through the platform. Any bank would do this. The bank that we work with does the same. Uh, and the data that we collect goes directly to our bank simply to verify uh, those kind of parameters and credentials. Um, so again, it's a, it's a banking level platform. Uh, we're making sure your money is as safe as you'd expect it to be anywhere. Uh, and again, we kind of add that automation component to keep you out of trouble. Did we uh, did we lose? I think we might have lost uh, the freelancers union. That's okay. You and I can chat, Ace. That's all right. Always, always. So you know, you and I were chatting beforehand about about freelancers and the challenges about saving money, and it's a big issue for a lot of my clients. It's tough. You know, this New York City, L.A., anywhere on the coast, it's expensive to live here. Clients don't pay us. If they pay us, they pay us erratically. You know, what are the challenges have you been seeing with freelancers? Yeah, I think the sporadic income is, is one of the biggest pieces, right? So um, money coming in, money going out, not really being able to, to accurately budget uh, or understand kind of what your income looks like, which is tough. Um, and so, you know, there are a couple of really cool platforms that we've seen on income smoothing out there, um, even level uh, a couple others. And so... Um, that has always been a big issue. And then the other piece is the calculation part. So just understanding what your obligation is based on how much you expect to earn and when you earn it. Um, and for that, you know, we've, uh, we've kicked out a calculator. I know there are a couple, a couple floating around, uh, but we kicked out a calculator that without signing up for a painless account, you can get information on how much you're going to earn. And so, you know, those are problems we've seen pop up. I think uh, folks like you, guys like us, uh, can really help solve some of those problems uh, if you just know the technology and uh, the expertise is out there. Let me ask you a question about the mechanics of your of your platform. So I'm a freelance. I'm a freelancer. I work for myself. Yeah, as do I. I, I need a, April 18th is coming up. 
So you can set aside money for me. Can your group pay, then pay the IRS for me and or New York State? Walk us for the mechanics. You set yeah. aside money, then what happens comes tax due date time. So yeah, not even just end of year, but for those quarterlies, quarterlies. Uh, we've got uh, a couple guides and um, we've got a guy, actually all of us here at the shop can help walk you through that. But uh, Aaron is our customer support expert. We call him our uh, director of customer engagement. And it's making sure folks on the platform get what they need. Uh, he built some guides and he'll walk you hand by hand uh, through the process of connecting to uh, EFTPS or direct pay at the IRS level uh, or um, at the state level, any of the state uh, tax platforms to plug in your painless credentials and then have the IRS or the state pull directly from that account. Um, so you can link your painless account to your uh, tax tax um, administrator to make those payments at the quarterly basis. Mm -hmm. And then at year end, you can empty that. Or I had my taxes pulled directly out of my payments account this year, which was really cool. Gotcha. So are you working on some sort of integration long term so that people can just just go to uh, like one stop? Is that something that's on your yep. platform? Absolutely. So the easy button is coming online. The IRS is obviously, as most people know, oh, wonderful. Um, a kind of beast to play with. But uh, yeah, we're building that technology out as we speak, and it'll it'll make it even more painless than it already is with the platform. And then it will truly be painless 1099. You set aside money like you would on a paycheck, and then it's automated, correct? Absolutely. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Looking forward to that. Uh, Laura, are you there? I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about that. My um, My computer just turned off. Um, so uh, we can get back to a couple more questions and then maybe call it a day. Sure. All right. Um, great. So 